So, Father, we lift all these things before you in the matchless name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. You know, it's a little uh, daunting in terms of just what Jesus shares in Matthew chapter 5 in terms of the nature of what he's calling us to as believers in him. It says here in verse 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Bless are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Not exactly the setting that we rejoice and be glad. <laughs> because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way that they persecuted the prophets who were, who were before you. So we have been ultimately looking at the nature of opposition that comes to us in the context of the Christian life. In chapter 10, we dealt with deception, and that kind of morphed into another couple of messages in terms of just dealing with deception in our world and how we need to be defended against that. But in moving on to the Joshua 10, the nature of the opposition we have is direct or indirect attack in terms of people actually coming against us with power and, and influence and so rather more mental and cognitive things actual force against us. And so as we turn to Joshua chapter 10, or maybe you're already there, uh, we read this in starting in verse 1. It says, Now Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon <clears throat> had made a treaty of peace with Israel and were living near them. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai, and all its men were good fighters. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Ho Hoham, king of Hebron, Param, king of Jeremoth, Jif Jephiah, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon. Come up and help me attack Gideon, he said, because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. And so basically what we see in the context of these verses here, I think the first thing that we would talk about is the fact that when confronted by the obvious work and person of God, as well as challenges, there are two basic responses. Let me unpack that a little bit. I think there's two things going on here. On one level, the king of, what is he, the king of Jerusalem, is confronted by the power of God, confronted by the work of God. You know, he, he's heard about Jericho, he's heard about Ai, he's heard, heard about the miraculous ways that God resolved things. It wouldn't be surprising that he would be aware of Egypt, he'd be aware of the plagues, he'd be aware of the part of the Red Sea, all the things that God had done in terms of revealing himself, and then, how am I going to respond to that? You know, the other thing that's going on is just how we in our lives orchestrate things to promote our peace, our comfort, and our safety. You know, basically, there's an expectation the king of Jerusalem is expressing here, where it's okay, these, this is what's in place that makes me feel like I'm doing good. Like, in other words, Gibeon is on our side, Lachish is on our side, all these kings are together, and we're able to protect ourselves against enemies, and everything's all copacetic, right? I've got the 401k, there's money in the bank, I've got the house, I've got the car, everything's good, right? Well, then all of a sudden, something comes and happens that disrupts the apple cart. All of a sudden, whoa, wait a minute now. Circumstances aren't coming together. It's not working the way I expected. Or this thing that I thought was going to be consistent and reliable, it's not there anymore. And I think both of those dy dynamics come together in terms of what God would desire in bringing us to a place where we have to make a decision. Like, okay, here's the glory of God. Here's the person of God. Here's the work of God. It's undeniable in terms of how he's revealing himself. Or here's this problem I really can't resolve on my own. And again, two basic responses. The first is humility. <laughs> like, humble yourself and receive it. Receive him. Come in line with it. In other words, I see God working. I, I see him willing to provide. I, I see him willing to come alongside me. So I'm going to come alongside him. I'm, I'm going to embrace this thing. I'm going to follow this truth. I'm going to pursue it in terms of just my responsibility to get to know him better. So again, that response of humility. Like part of us should say, 
like what what Adonai Zedek, why why aren't you doing that? Why is it that the response you have to the glory of the of God and the circumstances that you're presented with that I need to fight against this? Just realize there's another and better response, but the other response is again in pride. Oppose it. I see the glory of God. I see the work of God. I see this thing that I can't handle. Well, I'm just going to hunker down. I'm going to make my plans, and I'm going to make it better. Like, particularly in terms of opposing God. Like, I think it is, you know, we do have to understand, he's not attacking the Israelites directly. Okay, so maybe that's a measure of wisdom. Like, you don't go to these people that are clearly showing miraculous things in terms of how they defeat people, how God is working, and, and attack them directly. But you know something? Gibeon has been on our side. They've been part of our alliance. And now all of a sudden they've, you know, made an alliance with the enemy. Like, how dare them? I need to go after them. But it's still, it's still about opposing what, what the people of God are involved with. It's still about coming against what, what God is doing in terms of just orchestrating uh, the, the circumstances around. I mean, we do have to understand uh, the, the, the nefarious ways that this relationship happened between Israel and Gibeon, and we'll get to that a little later, but we're going to see that God, uh, God is promoting that, that he's doing something to support that in terms of the relationship that Israel and Gibeon have and so ultimately, we can see this in the context of this, this king of Jerusalem opposing the work of God, opposing the people of God. And boy, that is just an unwise way to approach things. Like, I, I believe the situation that we're dealing with here happens all the time. You know, the, the, the ways that God reveals himself, the way that God makes himself evidence, the, 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 the things that he does to reveal his glory Again, it's all around us. Again, the circumstances we find that, boy, I'm trying to make this relationship work. I'm trying to make the job work. I'm trying to make the family work. I'm trying to do the thing, and you just can't do it. Or again, the thing you thought was going to be the thing. I'm, you know, this is going to make me all set in terms of my future. And then all of a sudden it falls, it falls apart. I'm relying on the government. I'm relying on the economy. I'm relying on the stock exchange. And then, boom, it's gone. Well, what happens then? Again, so there's always this response of humility or pride. Now, in terms of just this pride element, some, th some other things I think can come in. Sometimes we ignore it. Sometimes we try to silence it. Sometimes we try to avoid it. Like in terms of, well, even Ken's testimony, <laughs> like, okay, I feel the work of God. I feel like God is moving me. I feel like God is, ah, I can't be that. It can't, it, this, it can't be because it's real. It can't be because I should really believe this. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to classify that in a different way. You know, there are a lot of things that people are doing with the glory of God. You know, something we're going to turn to in a little bit is Romans 1, where God says that his eternal nature and power are so evident in creation that man is without excuse. Not yet. Um, so, so, but, but basically what God is saying there is you should be able to see me. Even just a, how creation is, is made. Just the glory and, and power and intelligence that is found in what we observe. See, everyone is confronted by that. There's no one, the, no one in the world that doesn't have the sun cup in the morning. That the, the plants grow. Their bodies work. You know, for the most part, we see, we hear, we talk. You know, we heal. All these miraculous things that happen all the time. And what, what do people do with that? Like, you, 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 you can be glad that you've got it. Like, hopefully you're here because you understand you've got it. Yes, that is the glory of God. Yes, God is showing himself to be true and real. And, and then beyond that, in terms of Jesus and all the other things that God has done to show himself. Like, yes, I agree. I, I, I'm humble. I want to come in line with that. And that's how we should be and ultimately that is the message that we bring to the world that again you should come in line with the work of God as opposed to opposing it but I think this whole dynamic of ignoring it trying to silence the influence no 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 wait is that the conviction of God <laughs> am I hearing no let me, let me silence that <laughs> we, we don't want to go there I don't want to love Jesus more what are you talking about 
Well, we just avoid it. Well, let me not go there. Boy, the, boy, 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 every time I read that thing, every time I go to the church, I feel convicted. <laughs> I, I feel God moving in my life or showing me I should be doing something different. Well, let, let me just avoid that. Let me not read the Bible anymore because I might be, be transformed, become something I don't want to be. Um, so, um, and, and, and they go, they do, as I said, they go at in Israel indirectly, but it's interesting how God is orchestrating here. Like, well, what God is orchestrating? I mean, I'll understand that in terms of God's plan, he wants this land, this land is the Israelites, this land is the promised land, this is the land that he promised to Abraham. So eventually, Joshua would, would need to defeat all these kings. And so basically what happens is that rather than Joshua having, having to go to each of these cities and defeat them within their cities, God is orchestrating through this man's plan here to bring five of those cities to one place where God can deal with them at the same time in the open field. And so, so, so therefore, even in the spite of what is wrong in terms of what Adonai Zedek is doing in terms of bringing these people together, God is also orchestrating things. You know, I have to understand that the nature of our God is to do that very thing, to take the things that we're doing, even that are evil in nature, and turning them around to his plan. The things that we think are very simple in terms of what we do in obedience and God showing hey, I'm, I'm moving my plan along in terms of what I'm accomplishing. So that's another dynamic going on as far as, again, they attack Israel indirectly, but Israel is going to come in in defense of Gideon, but God is going to accomplish something in their defeat. But I think ultimately what it confronts us with is what has God done in your life to make it clear that he is real? Well, what has God done in your life to make it clear that he matters? You know, again, we're all accountable to that. We're, we're all aware of the things, or we should be aware of the things that God is doing. And if you could bring up Romans chapter 1, uh, verses 19 and 20, Kelly, for us to read. Since what may be known about God is plain. That, is that 20 or is that 19? Okay, maybe I need maybe I need eighteen. Ah, there we go. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Again, that's the avoiding. I'm suppressing like the truth is there, the reality of God is there, but I just don't want it. I'm going to follow wickedness, and that's going to suppress the truth of my life. But then, verse nineteen, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. So the bottom line for every person that has ever been created in the context of all of human history, they have the testimony of creation. They have the testimony of creation that points to the glory of God. And so therefore, there is no excuse why someone wouldn't attach the, the, what, what, what ha is happening in creation, all the glory that's there, all the goodness that's there, all the provision that's there, all the wisdom and intelligence that's there to say there's something else. I need, I need to seek that being. I need to go towards that creator, not walking away uh, from them. But then think beyond that what God has done for you. What, what he's provided in safety, what he's provided in guidance, what he's provided in terms of just different circumstances coming together. I mean, just think about Jesus. I mean, you had Jesus on top of creation and the glory of God being present on the earth, testifying to the things that Jesus would testify to, say the things that Jesus would say, do the things that Jesus would say, and then eventually die and then be raised. Like, like, there's enough father there, there's enough truth there in terms of all the things that God has done to reveal himself, that now, what are you doing with that? Like, what has God done for you personally to show that he's real, so that now, when you're charting the course of your life, where now you're confronted by a problem, again, are you running towards God, or are you running away from God? Or again, are you embracing the things of God, or are you opposing them? 
And that's the very thing. Like this Adonai Zedek, you, I mean, you, you could read the same thing and come to a very different conclusion. And this, this would be a very different message. That Adonai Zedek, Zedek realized that God was with the Israelites and he defeated Ai and defeated Jericho. And, you know, now all of a sudden this problem comes about that I can't handle. And so Adonai Zedek came to Joshua and bowed down and said, I want to know your God. Th that could be the story, right? See, I, I hope that's the story of your life. I, I hope, again, you're willing to come alongside people to show that you come to that conclusion so that they too will say, yeah, I want that to be my life too. That again, I want to come in line with what this, this God is doing, this God of miracle, this God of provision, this God of love, this God of mercy, this God of Jesus, this God of creation, and I want to follow him. Again, the choices are pretty basic. I either come in line or I oppose it and on some level. It might not be, you know, aggressively, I'm not going to beat up people, but I'm just going to avoid it. I'm just going to, no, 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 no. You, you, you follow, embrace, grow, seek, continue to go after the things of God. And so then it was, as we move on in terms of verse 6, so, so here, now the Gibeonites are overwhelmed, you know, it, it, like, like now there's a circumstance that they didn't expect, okay? They kind of deceived the, the Israelites in terms of getting into this covenant. But now all of a sudden they're faced with a situation that they can't handle. But ultimately they make the right conclusion. The Gibeonites has then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal, Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and, ha and save us. Help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal, Gilgal with his entire army, including all, the, all his best fighting men. And so again, this is, this is, the, this is the solution. This is the, 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 the events that are happening in terms of what God is going to do to ultimately accomplish what he is accomplishing. But what it shows us is, again, a promise made should be a promise kept. We saw that before in terms of you know, how Joshua did not... Even though, the, even though the Gibeonites lied to him, he still took, he took, took a responsibility for the decision he made to come in relationship uh, with them. You know, not, not yet. You know, it really is. I mean, the fact that, the fact that Israel, Israel does this, the fact that Joshua says, I am going to expose myself to danger. I'm going to run really hard to get to you. It's, it's, it, it, the, the level of commitment that is here for him is, is highlighted by the nefarious way this promise was brokered. You know, remember the Gibeonites come along and they say, with our foreign people, we don't have many provisions. You know, we're, we're kind of lost. We need to, you know, align ourselves with someone that's powerful in this area. And so can we come in a covenant with you? Because we're from a distant land. And they were like 20 miles away. And so they lied. They lied to Joshua. And Joshua didn't say, hey, God, what do you think about this? So he doesn't consult them doesn't consult God, and just then comes into covenant with the Gibeonites. But the fact that, God, that, that, that Joshua, I, that, again, saying Joshua, it's very hard for me not to say Josiah, um, but then you'll, then, you'll, then you'll realize that every word I speak to you, I'm just really speaking to my children. Uh, so, 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 no, I'm joking. Uh, so, but um, again, like what commitment this is showing? What, what, what pattern of honesty and, and keeping our word? And I think that's the thing that we really learn, learn from this is it really is just reinforcing, you know, what that next point, it, but it just reinforces the importance of honesty in any relationship as well as being people of our word. And it's so, it's so essential in terms of us, us being honest, to be upfront in terms of the things that we say. You know, you think about the power of words. You think about the, the, the nature of relationship, the nature of commitment, the nature of trust that needs to be present. You know, you think about what, what words are used for. You know, when you think about words that express logistics or relationship the words of logistics, commitments, affection, plans, money, time. You know, hey, pick up the kids here. I'm going to go here. Uh, you know, are, are you going shopping or am I, or am I going shopping? You know, words of commitment. Okay, we're going to do this on this day, right? Or again, 
I married you. I am committed to you. I'm going to be faithful to you. Words of affection. I love you. I, I care for you. I, I want to be connected to you. I want to, I want to you know, be in a relationship and move forward in terms of all the things that we would be together. Plans like, hey, let's do this and let's go here. Hey, let's spend money this way. Let's, you know, I only spent this amount of money. Or, hey, I'm going to be home at this time. Like, there's a lot of things we say. And the minute deception is part of it, it just doesn't work. The minute deception is part of anything that we're communicating, it just falls apart. And once, you, once you're deceptive in one area, it compromises everything else. Now, now, now what can I believe? Like, in other words, if you said a bold-faced lie in this situation, how can I believe anything now? And what I'm saying is that relationships are so dependent on, on again, words I speak, and, and, and I can trust that those words are true. That what you're committing to is, is going to be accurate. That you're going to follow through. You know, it just highlights that whole dynamic of, again, how, how, how evil it is. The, the tendency in us to, 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 to be deceptive, to skirt responsibility or paint ourselves in a better picture to other people. And we just don't want to go there. Like God, God understands what is required for human relationship. When, like when you think about what God orchestrates in terms of his creation. You know, okay, he makes a really neat world. And then he makes, makes people, like on purpose. <laughs> Imagine the God of glory creates people like us on purpose. And so he puts him and us in relationship. He puts a man and a woman together. They have children, and then they have children. And so it's kind of like the Fabergé organic commercial. I told two friends. And they, no, so they have a child, and they have it. And then all of a sudden, we are a society. And God knows how messy human relationships can get. He understands how fragile human relationships are. And that's why we have all the guidance in the word that says, okay, this is how you have to be. See, it's not only for you, but it's for other people. And again, we have, to, we have to guard against, we need to strive against not lying. Like ultimately, the devil, you know, he is a disruptor, he is a divider, and he just loves to tempt us to lie. He loves to tempt us to not be honest. And Joshua really is showing himself to be of honesty, a man of integrity, to say, hey, I am... I'm going to maintain this commitment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you pull one over on me, but I'm still responsible for what I said. Yeah, I got to this place for a wrong reason, but I still said this is what I'm going to do. And so again, it's something that we need to live, live in and commit to in terms of the way we engage with other people. What is interesting to me is that we never want other people to lie to us. Like, even when we're a liar, we don't want people, because we recognize how dependent we are to people being honest with us. And so go all a compromise when we lie. Another thing we've got to talk about this morning is another form of lying is gossip, and that too is to be avoided. Now, let me explain why I see gossip as lying. Because when I share negative information with someone else, that I would not share with you, I'm ultimately lying to you. If I come to a person that I'm, I've got friends over here and we're talking about you and we're tearing you down and so on, and then I'm with you and, hi, how are you? How's it going? What? Like, did you just talk about me behind my back? That's deception. I mean, that's not the only thing going on in gossip, but again, I think it's something that needs to be addressed and so we just have to understand how gossip de 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 destroys relationship. That's certainly what Proverbs eleven thirteen and sixteen twenty eight tells us. A gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy person keeps a secret. And then secondly, a perverse person stirs up conflict, and a gossip separates close friends. A gossip separates close friends. You know, you need to be, we need to be very, again, in terms of the sensitive nature of human relationships, we need to be very careful when we are sharing negative information about a person with someone 
that is not that person. I would say nine times out of ten, that's wrong. Like you would be hard pressed to find a situation. Like maybe if you're talking to the pastor, maybe if you go into someone that is godly and is going to use the information that you're sharing towards reconciliation, towards confrontation, towards dealing with the situation. But the minute you're sharing that information to try to make someone else think negatively about a person, that's wrong. And it's something, again, the Bible would instruct against, and God recognizes how damaging it is to relationships. Because basically, the minute it's found out, and by the way, it will always be found out. Like, 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 like <laughs> well, gossip is wrong because of what it does in your heart, what it does in the hearts of the person, people that are gossiping with you. But then when it translates to that person who you're talking about finding out, now again, that's what separates close friends. Like, really? Like, I shared that information with you in confidence. And you went and shared it to other people? Now understand, when we're talking about gossip, gossip is also about things that are true. Like, like, like slander is when we take something that's not true, that's negative, that we share with other people. You, you're, 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 you're fine. And I know I've said this before. If you have positive things to say about me, even things that you want to make up about me that are, that are not true, that are positive, you go right ahead. You know, you know, Pastor Peter is a great singer. That, that's not real. But, you know, like, like he's, you know, I, have you ever, you know, like, po- but again, when we're sharing negative information, particularly when, when our intent is to put someone down, like I think something negative about some, someone, so, or again, maybe about what they said or whatever, and now I'm going to share that with other people, so what? So they can think negative of, of that person too? Again, that is evil. That is pit of hell. That, that, that is destroying relationships that are the most important dynamic in terms of our lives. You know, certainly when we talk about the glory of God, our worship of God, our following God, yes, yeah, certainly that's the highest and best thing we would ever want to be. But if that does not translate to human relationships, then your faith doesn't matter. I mean, that's Paul's point in 1 Corinthians 13. You can have all these gifts, you can be spiritual and all these things, but you don't have love? Like you're not willing to go down to the depth of confrontation, forgiveness, understanding, and, 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 and honesty in terms of reconciling the relationships? That's, that's what love is. Love is your willingness to go to someone and say, our relationship is broken, we need to fix it. You know, that's what I would always say in terms of the responsibility we have as believers is the minute, again, the first thing I'm saying is if you have a negative thought that you're sharing with other people, that's wrong. But then in the context of relationship, you ever, if you're ever with someone and you being in that person's presence tweaks you on some level, like I can't, I can't talk to you the way I should, like this relationship doesn't flow. Do you have relationships that flow? Like, I trust you, you trust me, we're on the same page, we're looking for good for each other, and we just talk. And, we, and again, hey, can you help me, you know, break down the chairs, or can you help me fix this tire, or, hey, yeah, you know, relationships are good. Great. The minute your relationship is not that, you need to go to the person. What's amazing to me is that God gives responsibility to both people, whether you're the offending party or the offended party to go to the person and reconcile a relationship. Do you realize that? But they hurt me. You still have responsibility to go to the person. I hurt them. You're still responsible to go. Well, whatever it is, but the sign, the indication of that is when I'm with that person, again, it's not flowing. There's something disrupted. And what God would desire for you to do is go to that person. You know, one of the most powerful things that Jesus tells us is look at the log in your eye and not the speck of dust in the other person's eye. So again, you don't share negative information about someone with other people. 
You pursue relationship. If relationships are broken, you reconcile them, but you cannot miss the powerful dynamic that exists in Jesus saying, and the thing you talk about is what you did. You confront someone, this is I'm, I'm responsible. Like I have p p parsed it out. I have sought the counsel of God. I've sought his conviction. You know something? This is how I contributed to the situation. Like we are so, we are so uh, conditioned to defend ourselves. We are so conditioned to point the finger. So the worst thing you can do when you're engaging in conflict, you're trying to reconcile a relationship and you're pointing the finger. That's what Jesus says. Don't point the finger that way. Point the finger this way. And again, what's the log in your eye? What did you do? Like maybe if you see clearly after that, I love what he, the way he puts it. You know, after you've dealt with the log in your eye, yeah, well, hey, buddy, you've got a speck of dust there. Can, can, can I? Can, you see how that completely changes the dynamic of how relationships and communication should work? See, I mean, th th this is highlighting what, what Joshua is doing, for, to do, doing here. Again, how he's maintaining that commitment. He's being honest in terms of his relationship. And so, therefore, it gives us an opportunity to think about human relationships and how we're functioning in them. You know, like I said, you know, that, that, that love in terms of how prominent that is in terms of what God would desire to flow from us, there's nothing more loving... Maybe now I want you. It's really loving <laughs> when you're willing to look at your, the log in your eye and not the speck in the other person. That is a great, that's a concrete way of expressing love to others. First, it's, it's going to the person. First is the willingness to say, yes, there is a disruption. Maybe you don't even notice. Maybe the other person doesn't even notice, but you do. And so if you do, if you're the one that notices, you're the one that goes. Now, if you both know, that's no, you both come together. And you come in with all the grace, all the kindness, all the forgiveness, all the understanding, all the power and love that God has. But, but how loving it is to say, I'm not going to talk about what you did to me. I'm going to talk about what I did to you. But what's beautiful about that when you're dealing with believers, if the other person is doing the same thing, well, you know something, this is, this is what I did. This is how I broke things down. This is what I said that was deceptive. This, this is what I did in gossip. This is what... Yeah, talk, 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 talk that way and see how things get fleshed out rather than you being attacked and then you're defensive and you're getting back and you're attacking back. And even, even though, you know, Joshua is maintaining this commitment in a large scale thing. This is the Gibeonite people. This is the Israelite people. It's wise for us think, to think about what it means for us in the context of our relationships, because I think that those relationships are primary. Again, when God created us and put us in a relationship, he knew the mess that sin would make. He knew the brokenness that would happen, all the insecurity and fear and anger and stuff that riles, riles up in us and how we, we just put it on other people. Now all those other people are affected by the fact that we're that way. And now, now they become a little bit like that way, and so they're doing it to other people. God wants to bring wholeness God wants to bring health. God wants to bring normalcy. He wants us to have great relationships. And we become a model of that in Christ, in our marriages, in the church. And so just, just be aware of those things in the context of this. The next slide, I think, I don't think there's anything else on that one, right? Yeah, okay. I know my outline. And so basically now in verse 8, the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. And so how, how, how nice it is when God gives this counsel, gives this support, it expresses this presence with them in the context of their going to Gibeon to protect them, to operate in faithfulness to this covenant, and God affirms that. I mean, when you think about the missteps of not consulting God at Ai, or with Gideon, for, for Joshua just to maintain this commitment? Like, he's just being, like, what, what, what's interesting to me here is that Joshua does not specifically say, okay, Gideon's in need, God, what do you want me to do? Doesn't mean it didn't happen, but it's not talked about here. 
But what I like about that in terms of the lesson for us is he's just following the general will of God. He's just doing, this is what God would want me to do. But God, God would want me to be a man of my word. Yes, they were wrong in coming up with a relationship, but I committed to the relationship. And so I'm going to move forward in the context of that. And so God affirms that. You know, God joins them in terms of what they're doing. And so it's good that God sends this word. You know, it's nice when we get a word like that as far as us, you know, following him. You know, and then in giving this message, God is effectively validating Israel's commitment to Gideon. And, and it's, just, it's just interesting to me that, again, this is, you know, God, God, God desires for us to operate the, like this in human relationship, and he does too. <laughs> like, he, he's, he's not bringing Gideon to task about what they did. Well, we'll show them. They shouldn't have lied to you. No, you're like, you made the commitment, you're following through on the commitment, and I'm going to join you in that. So I validate the fact that you're being that, you're being a person of integrity, you're following through on the promise that you made. And God also promises to deal with our enemies too. This is ultimately the big picture of what, we, what we're seeing in this passage. Again, opposition in life, sometimes it's deception. We've got to be careful of people deceiving us in terms of how Satan would come to try to oppose us and trip us up in terms of our life in God. But sometimes it is opposition, direct opposition. Now we're fighting people. Now this is power and energy rather than thinking and arguments. And God promises to deal with our enemies too, confounding them, obstructing them, turning their plans on them, and vengeance is his. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good, like when you're, when you're, again, when I read from Matthew 5, <laughs> I'm, Jesus is just incredibly honest. <laughs> Hey, you want to feel, you want to follow me? Guess what? The world is going to hate you. Like people that are opposed to me, people that are avoiding my manifestation, they're going to have angst, they're going to have anger, and by the way, you're going to be a target. That, that, that's really what that means. So be glad. <laughs> uh, when was the last time you did that? Honesty. Last time I was persecuted and reviled for being a Christian, I said, thank you, God, for doing that. No, that's not the natural. But that's the ultimate truth. Wow, I get to, I get to stand with the prophets? Like, like I'm like people have, that have represented God in big scale biblical ways. And now as an individual person in 2023 on the human, on life in Rhode Island, North Kingston, New England. And I get to do that? I, I, I think that's, that's the point. But again, people come against us. P -p people are trying to disrupt your ministry. People don't want you to share the gospel with them or anyone else. You know, I do believe that the best way for us to think about enemies are people coming against our witness, people coming against the gospel, as opposed to people coming against us in societal issues. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that's true too. Uh, but, and, and I think God will, it's okay for us to pray for God to confound those things too. But I think more personally in terms of our lives, just realize when, when you're, you're like, I'm trying to witness to my neighbor. I'm trying to witness to my coworker. I'm praying for my brother. I'm praying for a family member. And there's opposition. Yeah, God, confound them. I'm stuck on. I'm always, uh, I'm not ready for our job yet. Um, I, I, you know, something I've shared this before, but I'm not sure where I shared it, whether I shared it. I, I tend to pray for people to hit walls in their life. Like, I, like people that are against God and not following God, help them hit, not, not physically, not Ken's experience of flipping a car, and, but like something they can't handle. Like they think work, they think life can happen outside of God. Show them that it can't. So <laughs> if you're in my life and I care about you, and you're not following God, that, that's what I'm praying for you. And so if it happens, just realize God has answered my prayer. Now, now come in line and follow him. You know, I, I would, wouldn't you desire that too? If you're doing something that God wouldn't want you to do, and God does something in your life to awaken you to that, so then you get back on track. See, I think that's a great thing. I think we have to be woken up. Uh, but, but when someone is coming against us, just there is a place for us to pray. There is a place for us to trust God. You've promised to take care of my enemies. God is going to, we won't get to this today, but God is going to take care of them in three different miraculous ways. Like, boom! They're like, this is how, just I, how I work. 
You know, the message next week is the battle does belong to the Lord, and we can always trust Him for that. But again, we, we, like, we're not, we're not, we are not facing any aspect of life alone. No aspect. So when people are coming against us, there is a place, that, you know, read the Psalms. Every other Psalm, you know, you can't read five, seven Psalms without coming to a place where David is praying, my enemies are at me, they're coming against me, confound them, obstruct them, turn their plans on them. And to just remember, vengeance is his. And so our job, <laughs> love our enemies. See, we, we, we sick God on our enemies, and we let vengeance be his. We, we love our enemies. And that's, that's what's reflected to us. Like, how can I rejoice and be glad and reflect the character of Christ to this person that's opposing me, that's coming against me? That's... That's, now, now, God, in justice, they, they need to be, you know, humbled. They, they, they need to have challenges. You need to reveal your glory. God, that is yours. That's what you do. And, and now this is what I do. And I think that's the dynamic that happens. Again, vengeance is not ours. We do not, we do not get people back. We do not retaliate. If there's reta now there's, there's law and there's right principle, you know, I'm not talking about that. Like in other words, you, you're supposed to pay me $1,000 and you only paid me $800. It's okay to go back and say, hey, you owe me $200. But if you don't, I don't go, well, let me, let me slit your tires. Because that's about $200 and I just have to get... We don't, we don't do that. But to pray, <laughs> God... You know, you, you, you know better what's going to help this person. You know the dynamics of justice. And so you, I, I sick, there's nothing more powerful you can do to sit God on someone rather than sticking. Uh, and I've, I've, I, you know, I, 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 you know, I think if you're a believer for a long enough time, if you haven't come to a place where, boy, this person is really, is really, you know, disrupt, particularly he's disrupting the ball. Like I'm trying to share the gospel. I'm in this meeting and I know there's three people I could share the gospel with and there's one person that keeps disrupting it. God, on it. And then, you know, if, 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 if what is shared after this is any indication, of, I don't think God does it in the uh, physical, harmful, dead kind of ways it does here. But you, you don't want to mess with God. Like these passages say, you don't want to mess with God. Like he can snap of a finger, you know, word of his mouth, and boom, it's done. And, 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 that, and that's the hope we have. That's the confidence we have that, again, there are, like there's really no flies on us. Like there's nothing, anything can happen. There's nothing anyone can say that affects who I am in Christ because of the glory of who he is, the glory of his perfect. Uh, his provision and the protection that he gives me. So let, let's bow and let's pray. Father, we, we, we understand that the, the dynamic of either following you or avoiding you or defying you. And I just pray that more and more in each of our lives, we would recognize the truth and the value of embracing you, of following you, of, of, of doing the things and being the things that you desire for us to be. I, I pray that that would be revealed in very specific ways about how, how we engage with your word, how we engage with worship, how we seek your spirit and his power in our lives. I, I pray that in very practical ways, we would show our alignment with you. And Father, if there's anyone here that is purposely or unintentionally defying you, ultimately not willing to join you on that train, I, I pray that you confront them. I, I do pray that they would hit a wall. I pray that they would see just who they're coming against and, 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 and ultimately be humbled by the context of that, recognizing that they're not able to make it work and by virtue of that coming to the God of glory. Father, I, I pray maybe particularly for, for children, for, for those of us that have children that are not in the place that God wants them to be. I, I pray specifically for them that they, they would understand that because of their association with us, that they, there might be a little bit more of a target on them and, 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 and responsibility for the revelation they've been given. So, Father, I, I just pray in whatever means are necessary 
to bring people to the faith, to, to convince people of your glory, that we would come in line with you. And so, Father, we lift all these things before you in the matchless name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.